let's get started with season two, episode one of 25, Spock's Brain. I'm going to stop you already because you said <laughs> season two. Fuck. That's what happens when you copy and paste all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Damn It, Jim, the podcast. We are talking about the one and only Star Trek, the original series. My name is Dana Smith, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend, Dan Calzretta. Good evening, Dan. Dana, we are in season three. Can you believe it? Yeah, and I was counting episodes today. We only have 25 episodes in season three. Wow. So we should be done by when? 25 weeks plus a couple for vacation here and there. Let's say 30 weeks. A lot depends if you take another month off. So it's a... (laughs) (laughs) I am going on vacation for Christmas, did I tell you? (laughs) We're going to Victoria. Oh, that's right. You did say something about that before. Victoria is a pretty city. Okay. Did you go have high tea at whatever that hotel was? No, we went and had a uh, strong beer. (laughs) That's better, probably. So, Dan, we did get some comments. Uh, Let me start off with uh, Lawrence Wagner, who said, Damn it, Jim, the podcast. I grew up with Star Trek as I was... 14 years old when it first hit the airwaves. Then after that, it was syndicated in the early 70s. Two TV stations in my area showed episodes every weeknight, one at four and the other one at five. So I could watch Star Trek for two hours almost every day. I became very familiar with every episode, having seen them all more times than I could count. Star Trek is my favorite series of all time because it had everything I could have ever wanted in a sci-fi show. And I agree wholeheartedly. On Facebook, I had created a collage of uh, as many episodes as I could fit in for the bonus episode. And Robert Stevens said, I see no bad episodes in that collage because I had said the good and the bad. He disagreed that there wasn't any bad ones in there. I don't remember what was in there. What would have been the bad episode in your opinion? I had a picture from uh, Old Glory or whatever the f*** that show Oh, the, the Omega Glory. Yeah, the Omega Glory. I also had the uh, Magatu and they're attacking Kirk. Well, that was awesome. That I mean, that scene. But the Omega <laughs> Glory was, was particularly bad. So, yeah, yeah I agree with you. Uh, William Kroll also said, you're going to squeal like a Magatu on season two? <laughs> So I'd be curious to see what he thought about our uh, season two bonus episode. So Yeah. And then uh, Lenny Balaban said, I need some cuddly Trek characters like Tribbles and the Gorn. (laughs) He's he's got a broad definition of cuddly. And finally, uh, Brian Levine says, Star Trek season two better when Gene Kuhn produced it. People thought that Gene Kuhn really added something to the show when he was involved. Okay. Dan, did you have any emails or other comments you want to share? Yeah, we got an email from Bob Gilski from Chicago, who says, really enjoyed the first two seasons of the podcast. The show has grown and evolved since the first episode. It boldly goes where no podcast has gone before. Looking forward to what season three will bring. That's awesome. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thanks for that. And send us some of that popcorn from, what was the place again, Dana? Garrett's popcorn. Garrett's, yeah, the mix, the caramel corn cheese mix. Send us like 10 pounds. (laughs) That's uh, 10 to Dan and 10 to me, yeah. so Yeah, 20, 20 pounds. (laughs) (laughs) And it won't last the weekend, so. uh, No, we have a candy store here in Walla Walla. They make all their own candies and stuff, and they also make caramel corn and cheese popcorn. And I was in there the other day getting a couple things, and I thought I should just have them make a mix for me, you know? But then I thought, I don't know. It, It might just not be the same you know what i mean yeah yeah that's uh it could ruin your taste then but you should try it sometime yeah i'm, I'm gonna go down there. they're open for another half an hour uh, i'll be right back dana <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine if i was just munching on popcorn during this whole... <laughs> i hate noises like that by the way oh my god i can't stand it dana <laughs> I didn't know you had so many dislikes and hates and stuff. You know, so. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I have a few like uh, things that bother me. This, I, okay, I, I, I'm going to ramble a little bit here. Uh, I'll start out <laughs> season three right. When I was in high school, this girl sat behind me in English class, first period of the day, and she would chew this gum and pop it. You know, you know, some people can like chew and constantly pop the gum. Oh, my. I I had fantasies in my head of turning around, (laughs) wrapping my hands around her neck and squeezing until her head popped like a zit. I mean, I 
I remember that very distinctly. I hated it, Dana. Hated it. Wow. Yeah. Did you seek counseling or anything for this? Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I probably should have. And and those kind of things like chewing, people swallowing, like uh, crinkling noises. Oh man, I yeah. Uh, like people cracking their knuckles and stuff like that. That bother you too? Yeah, not so much the knuckles, you know. But yeah, it, it does bother me. But not as much yeah. as like the like eating cornflakes or swallowing loudly, you know. So that's kind of stuff doesn't bother you at all. It does. I mean, uh, I've been like in the movie theater and somebody behind me is like munching popcorn oh. so loud that you can't hear. And it's it's like they don't know how to close their mouth and chew at the same time. That's that's the worst. People that chew with their mouth open, that bothers me more than anything. I think so. Chewing with their mouth open and talking at the same time. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's my mother-in-law. Oh, man. Oh One time, <laughs> she, I am not making this story up, okay? She doesn't listen, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> She was, we were, at, you know, having dinner with them and she's going along on some story that meant fucking nothing to anyone. <laughs> and she's got a mouthful of food and starts choking. Wow. Right. Like to the point where it was close to her needing the Heimlich. And the funny thing is there are probably eight people around the table. No one kind of made a move to like, hey, <laughs> this is our chance. Yeah. We wanted to, yeah, everyone wanted to see it play out, I think. And then she kind of coughed it back up into her mouth, kept chewing and kept talking. That's why we're going to Victoria. Did I mention that's why we're going to Victoria? <laughs> I was at a uh, business meeting one time with somebody who was uh, sitting across the table from them. There's like six of us. And this guy was a pretty smart guy, but did not know how to chew with his mouth closed, nor did he know how to not speak when his mouth was full of food. And of course, I was sitting across from him and I am watching like the food from his mouth land all over my plate and I completely <laughs> lost <laughs> My appetite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't go across the table and just deck him. I mean, <laughs> well, I wasn't paying for the meal. So, I mean, I was kind of like, but I just kind of sat there and, you know, I mean, I even put my arm up at one point, like, you know, kind of like my hand up a little bit so I could kind of block some of it, but it was like sure. too late. So. Wow. So we just went on about 10 minutes about chewing and noises and stuff. Get the ramble jar out. Yeah. Yeah. Ramble jar. Ramble jar is coming out. And I think we're going to hit it a few times today. Let's get started with season two, episode one of 25, Spock's Brain. I'm going to stop you already because you said season <laughs> two. Fuck. That's what happens when you copy and paste all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Dan, let's get started with Season 3, Episode 1 of 25, Spock's Brain. Okay, if you really want to, Dana, let's, let's, <laughs> let's get into it. Oh, I'm looking forward to this, Dan. Yeah. So we see a strange vessel, and uh, it's just kind of flying through space, and then we see the Enterprise. Inside, the ship is on red alert. Everyone watches the main screen. Spock reports the ship is unidentified, ion propulsion, unique technology. So a woman suddenly beams onto the bridge. Kirk, ever the diplomat, introduces himself, and the woman touches her bracelet, and the crew just falls where they stand. Yeah. She touches the bracelet again, and we see the crew members fall throughout the ship. We see sick bay in the hallway. Everybody's just dropping like flies. Oh, and man, the way Chapel fell in sick bay kind of throws the tray and yeah. twists around and hits the bed, and down she goes. And they, like, zoomed in on her when she was down on the ground. Yeah, they did, yeah. So uh, this woman walks around the bridge, smiling. She goes past Kirk, kind of pauses. Then she comes up to Spock, and she puts her hand on his head. Uh, on his cranium. Let's make sure we identify that. I have in parentheses. I'm sure Dan will have some comments about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too predictable, Dana. <laughs> We see the crew is still passed out. The lights slowly come back on and everyone wakes up, but there's no sign of Spock. McCoy calls up to the bridge and tells Kirk he needs to come to sickbay immediately. We see Spock on the medical table. He has something wrapped around his head like a linen napkin or something. Yeah, it's kind of gold looking, was it? Yeah, like he was at a nice state dinner or something and just really liked the napkin, so he took it with him. Wrapped it around his head. Yeah, and Kirk comes in and he realizes Spock is on complete life support. When he asks why, McCoy has trouble answering. And finally, McCoy says, 
He was worse than dead. His brain is gone. And Kirk says, if his brain is missing, then he's dying. And McCoy says, where'd you go to medical school? That's a <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> McCoy says, no, that incredible Vulcan physique hung on till life support was put in place. The autonomic functions continue, but there is no mind. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, Dana. <laughs> State that up front. How is any of this even, you know, possible? So Kirk then remembers the girl. He says she took it. He asks, how long can he keep Spock alive? And McCoy has no idea. Kirk says he will find Spock's brain. McCoy argues that even if he can find it, McCoy doesn't have the expertise to restore it. And Kirk says, whoever took it can restore it. McCoy says, you have to find it within 24 hours. Wait a second. <laughs> I was watching you because I was like waiting to see because I was the same thing I'm thinking. He just said before he had no idea. And now it's 24 hours? I mean, I know none of this is going to make any sense, but like, did they scoop it out like with an ice cream, big ice cream scooper? I mean, how do you get the whole brain out without damaging it? You know what I mean? Must have been some kind of surgery, big surgery, I think. There had to be. Yeah. They had to like saw the head open. Yeah. And then get the brain somehow. Disconnect it from everything. Yeah. Pop it out and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think they put it in? Was it in a jar, Dana? God, I hope it was in a jar. I really hope it was in a big jar. Dan, what else do you put it in? <laughs> what else do you put a brain in? <laughs> So on the bridge, we see the main viewer and everyone watching as Sulu reports, he found the Ion Trail again and Kirk orders warp six. Okay, here's another thing. They only have 24 hours, right? Yep. Why not go as fast as you possibly can? Go warp nine. Why not? Well, maybe Spock pissed him off at breakfast or something. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we get the captain's log, stardate 5431.4, and we learn that for 15 hours and 20 minutes, they have been following the ion trail of the spaceship that has Spock's brain. They lose the trail again, though they believe it went into the Sigma Draconis system. Sure, that's where anyone would take a brain. So, but I thought Draconis was a made-up system name, but there really is a star system named this. Really? Yeah. I did my research, Dan. Do they take brains there? <laughs> Once we uh, get somebody to go there, we'll find out. Okay. Checkoff reports there are only three Class M planets. That's pretty amazing. I mean, usually every planet is a Class M planet. And there are nine, right? Weren't there nine in the system? Yeah, I think there was nine. Yeah. Kirk says he's going to play a hunch and decides to beam down to Planet 6. Chekhov asks, what if you guess wrong? And Kirk answers, shut the fuck up. That's what. <laughs> I'm the captain. <laughs> So Kirk, Chekhov, Scotty, and two security guards beam down to the planet. God, I had some hopes, Dana, when they had those security guards with them. I, I thought we, we've got two in the bag. Yeah. So then uh, we cut away and we see a guy, kind of looks like a caveman, holding a club. <laughs> <laughs> so bad he's got an animal skin and like a beard down to his chest and stuff so the wig though was good i like the wig yeah i think it is probably the biggest wig we've ever seen but so this guy runs back and he tells his other cavemen pals uh something we're guessing it's like hey there's visitors here scotty using the tricorder identifies humanoids but he also says they're very tall and we see that the cavemen are gathering and coming closer or we assume that they are kirk tells everyone phasers on stun and and then the cavemen attack. They throw rocks. Landing party ducks behind big boulders. And then the cavemen throw some of their clubs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you were a caveman and your club's your weapon, wouldn't you hold on to it as long as you could? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Just, just checking. No one fires their phaser until like a couple rocks bounce off the boulder that Kirk's behind. And then he stands up and as the, one of the guys attacks, he shoots him with the phaser and knocks him down. Yeah. And the other guys like, look at what happened, the other cavemen. And then they all run off like they've just seen something incredible. So Kirk goes to the downed caveman as he wakes. And Kirk tries to tell him they're friends. Yeah, after he just shot him. And the man asks, you are not the others? And Kirk asks, who are the others? And the man answers, givers of pain and delight. And I knew right away he was talking about women. Knowing Star Trek and knowing the history of Star Trek, yes. Yeah, well, knowing the history of my dating life, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Chekhov comes up and says, there's an underground structure about 500 meters away. Kirk sends Scotty to find a way into this structure. And the caveman says, you can't go there. Then he pushes Kirk back and it looks like he's going to beat up Kirk for a second. Then all of a sudden he just runs off. One of the guards chases after him, but Kirk calls the guard back. Damn, I was upset about that because I thought that might be a chance for that guard to biff it. Yeah, I thought, you know, it'd be a, all these other cavemen waiting back there just, you know, with new clubs and yeah. stones. and Totally brain him, yeah. Yeah. So a moment later, Scotty calls and points out a cave with food and tools. As they check it out, Kirk spots sensors and says it could be a trap. Kirk steps out of the cave and calls the ship. He asks for McCoy to be sent down. Kirk tells Chekhov that he and the security team are to stay on the outside of the cave. Yeah, once again, I was hoping, you know, at that point, yeah. So McCoy beams down with Spock. <laughs> <laughs> And we see Spock has a metal device on his head. Yeah. And he's dressed in a green jumpsuit now. Why? Like, why change the clothes on him? Yeah, wouldn't it have been tough to, like, get him into that jumpsuit? I mean, get him out of his uniform, get him into a jumpsuit? I bet you Chapel insisted that they put him in a green jumpsuit. Sure, yeah. And, like, they had to find, this one was a little too small, it was a little too big. They had to you know, do this a few times. <laughs> And finally, just got the right one. She's like, yeah, this matches his skin tone. Yeah. He's a spring. <laughs> Did you ever hear that when people say that? Yeah. It's stupid. It's just so stupid. <laughs> Talk about things that annoy me. Good, good, good. Yeah, that's uh, I, I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah, and this thing he's got on his head, it's kind of looks like the, uh, was it a Romulan ship? Kind of looks like the Romulan ship, smaller version on his head. Maybe it was. Maybe they had, they had the model and they're like, well, we can probably just, re you know, season three, they're cutting back our budget. Paint it silver. Yeah, stick it on his head. So then we see that McCoy has a remote control in his hand. He presses a button and Spock turns to face Kirk and the landing party. Dana, I've got no words for this. And they made it like a dramatic moment. They kind of like zoom in on Spock's emotionless face. You're right. Scotty, Kirk, McCoy, and Spock enter the cave. When they cross the beam, a metal door shuts behind them and they begin to descend rapidly. And McCoy has the best line in the show. He says, call Chekhov and tell him to send my stomach down. It was a great line. And then Scotty uses the tricorder again and says they're getting closer to that source of power. He says it's strong enough to push this planet out of orbit. It's either a nuclear pile 100 miles across or it's ion power. What the fuck's a nuclear pile, Dan? <laughs> Didn't we have this once before? Yeah, we did. Yeah. A nuclear pile, I think, is the nuclear waste that's generated by a nuclear reactor. And then you pile it up. Therefore, you get <laughs> a nuclear pile. <laughs> I'll tell you, I had I had this cheesecake. Some friends of ours came over for dinner <laughs> last night, and I had a nuclear pile after that because I forgot to take some dairy medicine. Oh, yeah. The other morning, I had bran muffins and coffee. <laughs> and by the time I got to work, I, I think I set a new world record. I bet you I lost five pounds. <laughs> I'm surprised you made it to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was close. I thought I might have to pull over and jump in the ditch or something. So. <laughs> Oh, man. Dana, we're starting off season three and we're already in the toilet humor. Nowhere to go but up, Dan. Or for us, down. Yeah, so. <laughs> so they slow down and come to a stop and the door opens and there's a woman in a yellow skirt standing there. And Kirk is quick. He fires before she can reach the band on her wrist. So they move forward and Kirk checks her. McCoy gives her a shot to wake her up and Kirk asks, where's Spock's brain? Who's in charge here? I want to speak to him. And Dan, he said him. Yeah, he did. So the woman kind of talks like an idiot. She just keeps saying, you are not Morg or I Morg. <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing about a brain because I don't have one. <laughs> she seemed almost as dumb as Shauna. I, I need to rephrase that. She was dumber than Shauna. I mean, Shauna could form whole sentences. She was vapid. And Kirk says, you're lying. And McCoy uses a tricorder and says, she's not lying. She really doesn't know. Tricorder now is like a lie detector. Yeah. Or it measures like intelligence, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they should have used it to measure the writer's intelligence. Of this, so. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have this episode It'd be 24 episodes in season three <laughs> so kirk says we don't want to hurt you what is this place and she says this place is here <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I'm going to hurt you because that's the stupidest answer I've ever heard. And Kirk asks, who are you? Can you answer that? And she responds, I am Luma. I am Emorg. Is it Emorg or Imorg? I don't know. She probably didn't know either. <laughs> 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 so 
So McCoy says, You'll get nothing out of that one. Hers is the mind of a child. And that's an insult to a child. <laughs> <laughs> so Scotty comes up with a communicator and says, I've got something, but I cannot pin it down. And we hear Spock's voice say, Fascinating. Activity without end. Yeah, this episode seemed like an activity without end. <laughs> So Kirk uses the communicator and says, Spock, is that you? And we hear Spock's voice say, Captain, there is a definite pleasurable experience connected with the hearing of your voice. Kirk says, we'll get you, Spock. It won't be long. Spock says, a practical idea, Captain. It seems unlikely that I should be able to get to you. Yeah, and then we're going to get to the writer and we're going to remove his brain. I think somebody did that for us, Dan. I think you're right. (laughs) (laughs) So they start off down the corridor when they see the woman who appeared on the bridge. She's flanked by two morgues and old-fashioned garb, like something from Robin Hood days. And she's got like this 1960s miniskirt thing with the knee-high boots. Whoever's doing the tailoring for these people needs to get together and figure out what century they're in. So so Kirk goes for his phaser and says, she's the one. What have you done with Spock's brain? And the woman touches the band on her wrist and they are all knocked out. So next we see a pretty woman literally giving food to a morgue. I mean, like placing food on his tongue. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Didn't you find that odd? Like, why? So we see Luma pantomiming what had happened to her and it's hysterical <laughs> she like points her finger and then she like kind of like acts like she's fainting <laughs> it's like and then she's shaking her head no and the other girls are like listening watching her really closely it was almost like she was pantomiming getting shot with the phaser right yeah because she had been shot with the phaser she needs mime lessons that was not good what she was doing <laughs> So we see that all the men have a large belt with a green centerpiece on them. So the landing party are all asleep. So this woman, the one that was on the bridge and took Spock's brain, wakes them all up by touching a button on the band on her wrist. Kirk right away starts asking about Spock's brain. And Kirk asks, who controls this complex? And the woman gets a little upset and says, control? Controller? And Kirk says, yes, controller. I would like to meet him. Again, has to be a man. The woman gets angry and says, no, it's not permitted. Controller is alone. We serve the controller. No other is permitted near. She says, you have come to destroy the controller. And Kirk says, no, I promise you. McCoy says, we just want to talk to someone about Spock's brain. And she kind of throws a fit and she says, brain and brain, what is brain? So I got a couple things. You know, there are some lines in Star Trek, which I never will forget. One of them was from the Return of the Archons, where they're yelling, festival, festival. Remember that one? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes that will just kind of pop out. I'll just, you know, something will remind (laughs) me of it. And this other one is brain and brain. What is brain? (laughs) I mean, that is some Shakespearean writing right there, Dana. (laughs) So then Kirk steps away and then he drops to his knees and pretends to worship. He's like, great leader, we come to you from far away to learn from your controller. She says, no, you lie. You came to take controller away. Kara touches the band on her wrist and McCoy, Kirk, and Scotty are suddenly struck with pain. I don't know if you saw, Kirk looks like he's going to throw up. It's like his mouth gapes open, his eyes roll up in his head, yeah. and it looks like somebody kicked him in the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's what that thing was meant to, uh, to you know, simulate. This was Shatner, though, at his best. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, it was another Shat Fest. The other guys just kind of drop to the ground and roll around. So as they roll around the ground in agony, Kara says, I must learn. And she walks out and she says to one of the guards, you keep them here. So we get a ship's log from Sulu. He says, I am holding the Enterprise in orbit about planet Sigma Draconis 7. Captain Kirk's hunch that Spock's brain is on this planet appears to be correct. Ensign Chekhov remains on the surface to act as a liaison between the captain and the Enterprise. And in fact, we forgot to mention this, Chekhov uses a phaser to heat up a rock to stay warm with the two security guards outside the the cave, right? Yeah, one of the highlights of the show. Yeah, it was maybe the highlight. Back on the planet in the underground, the three men consider their situation. Kirk moves toward the door and one of the guards blocks it. Kirk then sees the communicators and tricorders on a table. And when he goes to that, another guard blocks him. And Scotty says, Now, those women could never have set up anything as complex as this has to be. Well, that takes engineering genius. 
But there's no sign of engineering genius in any of those women. This is so bad. I mean, <laughs> we predicted in our end of season two episode that sexism probably wasn't going away in season three. But for it to like rear its ugly head as quickly as it did... <laughs> It was a little surprising to me. I was not surprised. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so blatantly as well, right? Yeah. And Kirk says they were smart enough to invent these training devices pointing to the belt. This is what a way to maintain control over a man. And Scotty says... Pain and delight, he said above. And McCoy says, I'm sure you noticed the delight aspect of this place. And of course, Kirk says, Yes, I certainly did notice those delightful aspects. So Scotty asks, How does Spock's brain fit into this? And Kirk says, With the communicator, we might be able to find out. This fellow is keeping us from our property. And Kirk suggests they do something about it. And so they start fighting with the two guards. Mm-hmm. Kirk takes on one, and McCoy and Scotty take on the other. Then we have Kirk's stuntman, the man with kind of reddish hair. Mm hmm. Then they manage to beat up the guards, and then Kirk grabs the communicator and tries communicating with Spock again, and Spock finally responds. Spock says he has a body that stretches into infinity. Spock says, my medulla oblongata is hard at work, apparently breathing... Apparently pumping blood, apparently maintaining a normal physiological temperature. (laughs) You know, the medulla oblongata, Dana, is the connection between the brainstem and the spinal cord, and it does carry multiple important functional centers. It's comprised of the cardiovascular respiratory regulation system, descending motor tracts, ascending sensory tracts, and the origin of cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12. It's like there's the brain, and then there's the medulla oblongata is the thing that kind of like comes down to the brain stem. I remembered some things from my uh, biology class. Wait, did you take biology in college? Yeah, two or three times. (laughs) (laughs) So Kirk says, Spock, we don't have time for that. And Spock says, why are you endangering your lives by coming here? And Kirk says, we came to put you back. Spock says, back where? And Kirk says, back into your body. We brought it along with us. (laughs) Why didn't Spock start laughing at that point? Come on. (laughs) Spock says, thoughtful, Captain, but probably impractical. While I might trust the doctor to remove a splinter or lance a boil, I do not believe he has the knowledge to restore a brain. And McCoy says, thank you. And Spock (laughs) says, no denigration intended, Dr. McCoy. So that is, I'd say, one redeeming part of this episode is that little interaction between those two. True, true. It's one of my favorite lines. Yeah, mine too. It's probably my favorite line in all of season three so far, Dana. (laughs) So uh, Kirk says, the skill to remove it exists right here. Restoring it must be possible, too. As they go out of the room, Kirk asks Spock about the bands around their stomachs and how to remove them. Spock says he'll give it his highest priority. A minute later, Spock tells him that a red button on the wristband will release the belts. So they continue to go down the hall. So uh, Scotty says, Spock must be inside. And they go through the door, and we see from inside the room, we see Kara next to the main complex thing that we think Spock's brain's in. She looks sad and perplexed. She turns and sees him and pushes a button on her wristband. They all start writhing in pain, except for Spock. McCoy drops the remote that helps Spock move. And so while they're writhing on the ground, McCoy points out that Spock is unaffected by the pain device, and Kirk tries to crawl towards the remote. And he finally reaches out and gets the remote as he's in terrible pain. And he pushes a button, and Spock starts moving towards Kara. And I was in terrible pain, I tell you. <laughs> So he pushes another and Spock grabs her wrist and she tries to fight him, but he's holding on. Kirk makes another move on the remote and we see Spock's finger move along the band on her wrist and hit the red button. I mean, earlier it was like the controller didn't have a lot of functionality to it, right? And all of a sudden, Kirk, who's never touched this controller before, (laughs) he's figuring out how to like do very fine motor skill actions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I had the same thought. It's kind of like the transporter on the ship, Dan. Once you know how to run one technical thing on the Enterprise, you can run every technical thing on the Enterprise. So all the bands pop off. The men stand slowly. Kara yells at Spock. The controller is young and and powerful. Perfect. How very flattering. (laughs) 
Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> so bad. Kirk goes to Kara and asks about putting Spock's brain back in his body, and she says she doesn't know how. And he says, You took it out. McCoy says, She can't, Jim. It's it's like the brains down here have atrophied from lack of use. Uh, I tell you whose brain atrophied, okay? <laughs> Mine watching this episode. <laughs> And probably every other human being that watched this episode. I mean, I think we could probably blame this episode for the collective loss of 50 SAT points in the United States around 1968. Wow, you know, you just made me think of something. I I watched this episode the night before I took the uh, ACT test. Maybe that's why I didn't score as high as I thought I should. The thing is, you remember it. That that was a traumatic experience. <laughs> yeah, well, it was the first time I saw it, you know, and so it was uh, it was traumatic. You know, you get the results back and your parents say, Dana, use your brain. And you said, brain and brain. What is brain? <laughs> Yeah, and then my dad knocked me across the room and said, I'll give you a brain. <laughs> I'll brain you right now. <laughs> all comes together now. <laughs> it does all come together. <laughs> all starting to make sense. And my wife, who didn't like Star Trek, she didn't see it. And there she, yeah, there you go. She became a doctor. But I bet you she watched the show the night before you guys got married. So was, uh... <laughs> <laughs> she had that same vapid look, Dana, at the altar. <laughs> It was either that or the realization of what actually was about to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you mean until death do we part? <laughs> I'll kill him right now. <laughs> <laughs> McCoy says her mind is functioning on a very simple level. And Kara says, it was the old knowledge. And Kirk asks how she got the old knowledge. And she says, I put it on my head. The teacher. I'm sorry, David. <laughs> the dialogue is just so freaking stupid. <laughs> just dumb. So here's the deal. Okay. <laughs> Throughout history, great examples of literature, right? Going way back in time. But what are aliens going to see? None of that literature got like broadcast into space because there's no, there was no ability to do that in Shakespeare's time or whoever, right? What they're going to end up seeing is this episode and the three freaking <laughs> stooges. That's what people in, like out on alien planets and far reaches of the galaxy, they're going to see this episode and knock, 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 knock. Whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> Like, well, yeah, let's not go there. That's why I'm convinced there have been no alien visits to this planet, because they would have taken one look at television and been like, mm, not worth it. So Spock says she was referring to an impressive storehouse of knowledge from the builders of this place. So Kirk goes over to this glass helmet, and it's got several pieces of metal sticking out of it. So Kirk insists she use it to restore Spock, and she says she cannot. It is only by order of the builders, who've been dead for thousands of years. Kirk pushes her under the helmet, and the computer starts working. Kara comes out of the helmet and says that Kirk and the team do not give her enough credit, for she is the one who uses the knowledge. Kirk says, we appreciate your ability and Kara reaches under her dress and pulls out a phaser <laughs> so, okay Dana I'm <laughs> look I know you're baiting me on this one I'm not I'm not going for it Dana I'm not gonna go for it where do you think she had that tucked away Dan? <laughs> I'm not going for it Dana I'm just not <laughs> and she says then you'll appreciate that the teacher has given me the knowledge on how to use this and Scotty looks down at the phaser and says it's set on kill Kirk says if you continue you will kill Spock Kirk says no one may kill a man not for any purpose. It cannot be condoned. Dan, where, where'd that all of a sudden come from? How many has he killed? Because he says it doesn't matter for the reason. Not for any purpose. Then Scotty moans and acts like he's going to faint. And while she's distracted, Kirk takes the phaser from her and Scotty grabs Kara by the arms. And Kirk goes on saying, you must put back what you have taken. And she says, no. McCoy says, if it worked for her, it might work for me. And then Kirk tells him to put the teacher on. McCoy stands under the helmet and Kirk lowers it on to him. McCoy suddenly seems in pain. Kirk goes to him and McCoy says, of course, a child could do it. Same child that wrote this stupid episode. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing we see is McCoy is kind of working behind like a little half wall and Spock is lying on a table with the top of his head inside the wall. And I mean the very tip top of his head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I don't think he could trim his hair as much as showing through the other side. McCoy is so far up, his arms would have to be three times the length to reach down <laughs> to where Spock's head was. So Scotty is watching McCoy work, and he says, I've never seen anything like it. He's operating at warp speed. That accent was pretty good, Dana. I've been practicing. And he says, I might give that teacher a try myself. <laughs> sure you will. I wish the writer had used the teacher on his head. Meanwhile, Kara is bemoaning the fact that they will now be destroyed. And Kirk tries to assure that things will be okay, that they will survive, that they'll work with the morgue above ground. Uh, we cut back to McCoy and suddenly he seems unsure. So Kara says, the morgue will not help, not without the pain. And Kirk says, there are other ways. And Scotty's been watching McCoy this whole time, and he realizes what's happening. And he calls Kirk over and says, he's forgetting. McCoy says, what am I supposed to do? All the ganglia, the nerves, there are a million of them. What am I supposed to do? I tell you what you're supposed to do. Shut the <laughs> fuck up. <laughs> Kirk says, Bones, you can't stop now. McCoy says, I'm, I'm trying to thread a needle with a sledgehammer. And Kirk says, give priority to connecting Spock's vocal cords. How would he even know where those are, Dana? <laughs> Jesus. And are the vocal cords directly connected to the brain? I want to get a doctor on the show just to tell us how stupid this is. Yeah, we need to get a neurologist. I mean, not just any doctor. We can get a veterinarian no more than this guy wrote that wrote this. And we can get one of the dogs a veterinarian operated on the no more than the writer of the show. Uh, so we see a montage of shots. McCoy struggling. Kirk and Scotty watching. McCoy finally says he's dying and I can't stop it. And Spock speaks and helps McCoy reconnect his vocal cords. Please stimulate the nerve endings and observe the physical reactions one by one. Coy turns to Kirk during all this and says, I'll never live this down. This Vulcan is telling me how to operate. And a little time passes and McCoy finally states, closed. Then says, I could have made a thousand mistakes. Spock sits up and stretches. His hair looks perfect, by the way. He's not wearing uh, anything around his head. And Spock says, congratulations, doctor, and thank you. And Kirk asks, how do you feel, Spock? And Spock says, I'm the whole captain. I believe I am quite fit. Fascinating. A remarkable example of retrograde civilization. So he goes on and on. And McCoy says, I shouldn't have done it. What's that? I should have never reconnected his mouth. So Spock kind of raises an eyebrow and Kirk says, well, we took the risk, doctor. And everybody breaks up laughing. And Dan, that's how the show ends. So Dana, you have something to tell us about one of the actors in the show. Yeah, Dan. Uh, Marge Doucet, who played Kara, was actually a well-known TV actress. She actually received a uh, Emmy nomination for one of her roles. Wait, wait, Dana. For this role? No, not for this role. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She also worked briefly with Elvis in the movie Clambake. Wow. Wasn't, uh, what's her name? Angelique Pettyjohn was also in Clambake. Wow. That's crazy. So during the 60s and 70s, she appeared in shows like Wild Wild West, Mannix, Hogan's Heroes, The Bionic Woman. She had reoccurring roles in soap operas, notably Capital, Days of Our Lives, and The Guiding Light. She retired in 2017 and she passed away in 2020. So Dan, this was the last episode to be directed by regular Trek director Mark Daniels. Now, was he fired because of this episode or <laughs> did he quit because of this episode? I'm of the mind that he quit because of this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, he was unhappy with the budget cuts. The series suffered for the third season and the direction the whole show seemed to be taking. Well, he was a smart man. Dan, do you have anything for us? Yeah, a couple things, Dana. One, one thing that I heard about this episode is that when they were filming it, there was kind of a gag scene that got filmed. It's not in the blooper reel, as far as I recall. And it's too bad. This would have been hilarious. And it shows Leonard Nimoy in handcuffs. And someone's got a prop gun that's pointed at him. And he's holding a newspaper that says Spock gets two-year prison term. Well, that was a real newspaper, but it was about the psychologist Benjamin Spock, who was sentenced to prison after encouraging draft evaders and claiming the Vietnam War to be anti-constitutional. So, kind of interesting, I thought. And a bit of a historic reference, really, to the Vietnam War and how unpopular it was. Very true. Dana, what about a theme or dilemma for this episode? Oh, Dan. Uh... <laughs> 
the only thing I could think of was how to bring this to a good ending without being completely stupid, and they failed. So how about you? Do you have any themes or dilemmas you want to talk about? Yeah, this is the dilemma for me. Not only is Spock's brain missing, but so were the brains of the writer, the director, the producers, everyone involved in like green lighting this thing. Well, let's move on to uh, the best and the worst, Dan. Do you have any uh, best moments for us? I actually do. Sulu was in the captain's chair. That was one of my best moments. How about for you? Uh, Looked to me like Kirk has a new hairpiece. I was wondering if it it was the one that was up for auction. Do you have any other best moments, Dan? No, but the one I'm going to give you is just as with the alternative (laughs) factor, when the credits started to roll, that was a best moment. (laughs) How about another best part for you? Chekhov warms up a rock with his phaser. I'm guessing you've got another best part. The remote control for moving Spock around. I mean, that that thing was amazing. Dan, do you have a worst part for us? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many, 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 many worst parts, Dana. The concept of the show, the device that controls Spock, the dialogue. But really the worst, though, for me, Dana, is how women are portrayed as being mindless, stupid creatures that must be controlled by a man or at least a man's brain. Not only is sexism back, Dana, this might be the worst example. How about a worst part for you? Dan, where do I start? The stupid women, the cavemen, Spock being moved around by remote control, the bad dialogue, cheap production values, the final surgery. Does anyone know anything about the size of a freaking brain and how it connects to the spinal cord? Obviously not. There's no way McCoy could perform the operation on the top one eighth of Spock's head. (laughs) (laughs) Holy crap. I was like, as I kept going through this, I mean, I could have, could have extended my list like a whole page. How do you really feel Dana though about this episode? (laughs) Other than that, it's all right. You know, (laughs) Do you have another worst part, Dan? Yes. Shatner, Kelly, and Doohan acting as though they're in pain. How about another worst part for you? Spock's brain in a machine. How about you? You got another uh, worst part? No, it's just everything. Dana, how about you? Another worst part? You go back and you watch Kirk's speech to Kara. It is so stupid. You know, you'll figure it out. Don't worry. You'll you'll work with the morgue, these cavemen type guys that you've been using as slaves and who knows for what else. It's insulting. I mean, if I was Kara, I would have kicked him in the crotch. And it was just bad dialogue once again. Dana, hopefully something good happened on this day in history. We know the show was not one of them. The show aired on September 20th, 1968. The number one song in the U.S. was Harbor Valley PTA by Jeannie C. Riley. And in the U.K., the number one song was Those Were the Days by Mary Hopkins. So, Dan, also on September 20th, you were asking for good news. Uh, tragedy struck the Farnborough <laughs> Air Show. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> way you said it was just funny but i i'm 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 gonna apologize in advance to anyone who might still be alive who has witnessed whatever this tragedy is that we're gonna hear about okay dana go ahead tragedy struck the farnborough air show the united kingdom's largest air exposition and second largest in the world for the first time since 1952 when a french air force fuck it's another french name (laughs) (laughs) okay hold on let me help you le (laughs) favre (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's briquette atlantic crashed into the offices of the royal aircraft establishment one of raes that's the royal aircraft establishment civilian maintenance staff was killed as were all five members of the crew there's only five people dead right or si- how many six six that's a tragedy i mean <laughs> well i'm sorry it wasn't 50 <laughs> i mean okay. i'll see what i can find for you <laughs> i mean it's bad it's bad i mean a tragedy is like 100 people i think dana 50 to 100 people not to those six people that's a tragedy well they're dead they don't care but maybe to their families i mean okay there we did have one tragedy last year maybe it was in the first season that was a true tragedy and that's santa crashing and burning at the mall <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Oh, that was a tragedy. Also, Dan, on uh, September 20th, Eastern Airlines Flight 950 was hijacked during its flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Miami and diverted to Havana. <coughs> now we're moving on to the counts, Dan. How about the dead crewman count this week, Dana? Unfortunately, none. So we're still stuck at 47. How about the shirtless Kirk Rip shirt Kirk count? None. So we're still at 17, Dan. The he's dead count. Nope. 
McCoy didn't say anything like that, so we're at 14. I'm a doctor, not a fill-in-the-blank. Not a brain surgeon. I, I don't know. <laughs> could have said any number of things. Yeah, you could have, yeah. And But he didn't, so we're still stuck at eight. How about the supreme being count? Dan, I think we need an anti-supreme being count. <laughs> this just pissed me off, so we didn't have anything... <laughs> close to resembling a, and a halfway intelligent being uh, in this episode. So we are still stuck at 10. How about a violation of the prime directive count? Dan, I've, I've gone back and forth on this. I think we have to count this. Kirk changed their whole civilization. Yes, I am in complete agreement with you. Absolutely. So that puts us into double digits on that. We are now at 10. All right. And taking over the Enterprise count. Well, Kara came on board and just knocked everybody out. She didn't really take over the Enterprise. But she did turn the lights off <laughs> and then turned them back on. Remember? I mean, I think take over the Enterprise, you got to like take it and go somewhere with it, you know? Yeah, and if she turned all the power off, then, you know, the Enterprise would have crashed into the planet and this whole episode would have been a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> it thankfully, would have been a lot shorter. Yeah. All right. So you're saying zero then. That's what I'm saying. All right. I, I, I can I can go along with that. So we are at 10 on taking over the Enterprise, Dan. Dana, you want to tell us about the new count we have to start off season three? Yeah, we've been asked to do this for most of season two of who Who's commanding the Enterprise when uh, Kirk is not around? So this this week it was Sulu. So there's one. Yeah. I have a tally of 23, Dan. Whoa, 23. Let me do a quick count for you. Sulu was in charge in the Omega Glory. He was in charge on Errand of Mercy and then again in Spock's Brain. So that's three. Yeah. Uh, Leslie was in charge uh, or is in the command chair for the Alternative Factor and Squire of Gothos. Okay. Chekhov was uh, in the command chair for Journey to Babel. Scotty has five, A Taste of Armageddon, Journey to Babel, because you can have more than one person sit in the command chair in the same episode. What about at the same time? Friday's Child, mm -hmm. which had Julie Newmar in it, by the way. Really? I didn't know that. Bread and Circuses. Yeah. And a piece of the action. Uhura, we counted her as one time, and I can't remember the episode, but I remember us discussing it. Yeah, we didn't actually see her, but what she said over the communicator indicated to us that she was in the command chair because she initiated a red alert, I believe. Yes. Spock had 11 through seasons one and two. And then DeSalle was uh, in the command chair for Cat's Paw. Yep, that's 23. Well, that's great. I'm glad you did that, Dana. What, what are we calling this count, by the way? Who's Who's commanding the Enterprise? Dan, what's up next week? Well, Dana, it's got to be better than this episode. That's all I got to say. Next week is the Enterprise incident. As I remember, that's a good one. I think we've got nowhere to go but up with this. I can't wait to watch the Enterprise incident. Dan, I think this episode was a great way to kick off season three. It was a lot of fun talking about it. It was so horribly bad that we got to enjoy our dissection of it. Yeah, Dan, uh, looking forward to what's coming up here in season three. As we mentioned in our bonus episode that uh, there are a few episodes in this season we're really looking forward to. This was not one of them. Let's see what happens. And this has been great getting together with you again and talking about Star Trek. So until we meet again, live long and and prosper. Thanks once again for listening to Damn It Jim, the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at dammitjimpodcast at gmail.com or join the discussion on Facebook, X, Instagram, or YouTube. You can also give the Damn It Jim hotline a call at 509-676-6298. Leave us a message, and if we like what we hear, we may even put it on the podcast. Make sure to join Dan and Dana next week for the Enterprise incident. Enjoy the rest of your week and until we see you again, remember to live long and prosper. This has been a Ramble Jar production. 